All right. All right, we're, we're live. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, be excited to have another, um, I guess, video for you as part of Audible New Zealand Coaches Network. Um, tonight or today, whenever you're going to be watching this, uh, we've got uh, Mick McKinnon, who's a, a former colleague of mine from my time in Ireland. Um, pretty well, very experienced coach in hockey. Uh, he's currently the assistant coach of the Irish women's uh, national team um, and a pretty experienced coach developer through Irish hockey as well. And, and I've learned to heck of a lot from him um, over the three years or so that I was in Ireland. So um, awesome to have him on the call. And he's going to he's gonna share his some of his experiences and thoughts that I think are, are applicable to, to volleyball. Um, and then we've also got Mike Dudson, who I'm sure the majority of you will recognize. Um, so, you know, Mike's an incredibly experienced coach um, in the volleyball space here and is currently coaching the, uh, the top um, women's beach volleyball team uh, here in New Zealand. And also, again, a very experienced coach developer in his, as a, in his own right um, from his time working uh, with Volleyball New Zealand. And I'm sure there's a lot of other roles you've filled over the years, Mike, within a, with a volleyball context as well. So two, two incredibly experienced um, coaches and coach developers on the call. So the conversation is going to be going to be pretty good, I think. Um, the the concept for this video is is Mick's going to run us through. I don't know another way to, to I don't know the best way to call it, Mick, but I'm calling it a skill development pyramid, um, which which he's kind of developed over over his career in hockey. Um, so he's going to present that, and then I'm going to pass over to Mike just to see how Mike thinks that translates to volleyball, and then the, the conversation is just going to flow from there. So it's going to be pretty informal, and it's probably going to go in a number of different directions. But, um, I, you know, the purpose of this is just to get you thinking and to really reflecting on how you coach volleyball and whether there's anything, any principles or any ideas from the conversation that just get you to think and reflect and, and challenge the way you coach, I suppose. So that's the that's the, the end goal and the outcome from, from a Volleyball New Zealand perspective is hopefully you can just go away and challenge and think about your, your coaching and, and refine your, the way you do things. So without further ado, Mick, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, man. Um, thanks. Uh, well, you said we'll, we'll have a look at um, what some of the stuff we do and how it's applicable to volleyball. I think we need to change that word to if it's applicable to volleyball because we're we're sailing a bit blind here and the sports are, are quite different, but we, when I, when I first got involved in coach ed, my feeling was that the way we trained players was quite linear, you know, that we, we, we tried to build them from the bottom up. Dave, can you pause this video here a second? Can you, cause my son's got All right, cool. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So yeah, we, we, uh, we felt that players were being coached in a quite linear manner in that we taught them what to do before we put any context on how to apply it or where and when to apply it. And the way I would define technique and skill is that skill is the application of the correct technique at the right time. So it therefore requires decision-making as part of the process. And, and there are no decisions in for want of a better word, drills. Okay, so we came up with this pyramid. I'll share the screen here with you here. And uh, um, this was the pyramid here that we came up with. Can you see that now? Did I do that correctly? Oh, yeah. Uh, there we go. Okay, so we started with at the top with what do we want to achieve? Now, I'm actually wrestling with that word there. OK, principle, because I don't really like it. It's quite vague and you spend quite a lot of time on courses trying to get across what it means. OK, and I'd actually like to change it to the word goal, which is just what we want to achieve in a phase of play. OK, and the problem with the word goal is in the sport that I coach, it has another meaning. So it, it again confuses people. So you know, if you guys can come up with a better word, but basically it's what do we want to achieve here? Now the tactic is the way that we want to achieve it. So there'll be a bit more detail in the tactic. So for example, the principle in hockey, our opponents have got, have got the ball in a, in a dead ball situation. So we can set up a structure, which we call a press. 
the, the principle might be we want to win the ball high up the field and on the inside to make attacking easier. So, um, the tactic will then be the detail of how we do so. Okay. Now, if we start with that as our starting point, what do we want to achieve? How are we going to do it? Then we can address, well, what skills do our players need in order to achieve that thing that we want to do our game plan? So you identify the skills. And the skills are underlined by technique. So I'm not one of these people who says we should never be drilling players because I believe you can learn technical stuff via drilling players. Okay, But when I first came into coaching, it seemed that we built that pyramid from the bottom up. We'd teach players how to do things. We'd drill them. They'd run around cones. They'd do, do all sorts of stuff. Then we'd put them in situations where they, they had to apply them. And quite often they were forced. You know, you, you, you play a game where you can only do this. Well, once you take choice out of something, it ceases to become skill anyway. Okay. And then you'd put them in game situations and you try and teach them tactics. So basically what would happen was this pyramid would be built like this, bottom up. Okay. And what, what we've tried to do is we've tried to have all four of these things featuring in every training we do and not in isolation. It's not right. We're going to do the technical stuff. Now we're going to do the skill stuff. Everything we train, every exercise we train in an ideal world should contain all four of those things. And the pyramid gets built from the middle to the outside, as opposed from the bottom to the top. I hope I've explained that properly. Yeah. All right. I mean, I think you have. So, Mike, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. What, what are your thoughts from a, uh, a volleyball perspective? Yeah, well, um, Dave, thanks for um, inviting me into this. And, and, and Mick, that, that sharing, when you shared uh, that model a, few, well, a week or so ago, and I looked at it, and I, I looked at it again, and I looked at it again, and I, I thought of the free-flowing hockey movements, and then... You know, it percolated overnight and I woke up in the morning. And I thought, oh, what about that? And what about that? And, and slowly I started to think, yeah, this has got some real nice applications to, um, to volleyball. Um, what I really liked about it was um, that there was some linkage there between what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it. So, and, mm -hmm. um, and then I have a few questions. There's a few more questions I have for you, Mick, that, you know, mm -hmm. that hopefully will provide some insights um, as well. But... My initial thinking of it after, you know, letting it percolate for a day or two was that quite often we'll be playing or we'll be doing something and it's really clear as day in my head what we're trying to do here. But, you know, two weeks down the track, you know, the athletes, one of the athletes will say a question which goes, oh, well, if you're asking that question, we weren't even on the same planet, let alone the same page. And uh, through no fault of the athlete, through my not being able to communicate what we're trying to do, what the code's all about. So I thought this model here um, would be a really great way of firstly, me getting real clarity around how I can um, link a technique and the skill and the tactic. Um, but secondly, um, about how I can, when, I'm, when we as a team, uh, get, trying to get on the same page and get our code right and, and, and have a shared understanding, which is ultimately, you know, in our situation with the three of us, but in a team, in an indoor team with far more players. So one of the questions that I had is, what involvements do the team have in building the pyramid? Do you have any involvement of the team or the, or the coaching staff? And how do you go about getting that, you know, that... Um, sequencing from um, so it all aligns up well it starts at the top so it depends on the coach and how much um, input they want their players to have in the style of play mm -hmm. that they play and that input might be overt in that you sit down with the players and discuss it or it might be the fact that a good coach will build their principles around the players available to them so you know you might not walk in and say this is the way I play. You might look at what you have and, and say, I'm going to build a style for them. So it can be one or the other. Mm. Then tactically, um, sometimes that evolves. So 
it what i quite like about it what's quite powerful about it is the other word i'm toying with for the top of the py pyramid is mission this is what i need you to achieve in this phase quite often if you just give them the mi mission they might figure out a way better than you you had in your head anyway um so there's player involvement there as well so you know there it, it, it depends on the coach and it depends on the players that they're coaching um but certainly you know i i'd be quite vague when we start something so i'd say right here's here's a phase this is what i need you to achieve off you go okay mm -hmm. and then we might flesh it we might flesh it out a bit from there via discussions with the players so but probably yeah. the yeah, sort yeah. of coach i am and dave knows in the back of my head i'm probably going to try and lead them to where i want them to go in the first mm -hmm. place anyway so mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I like that. Um, I suppose from a, the other uh, comment, as, as we are moving in a volleyball area, um, you know, with the, one of the target here is, is, you know, we talk about quite abstractly at this up to this point, but then I think, you know, if we think about it, volleyball is out there, if you think about um, a really concrete example of this, and I think we see it in the Australian beach team where, you know, one of their philosophies is to, is to hit the ball on too. Um, mm -hmm as much as possible. So instead of our traditional three hits, we're going to try and hit the ball on too. And, um, you know, that's a definite tactic. And, you know, there's some certain skills that are required with that. And mm -hmm. um, then those skills would obviously be both in the pass and in the second play. And, and, and then also I thought, well, that would quite have influenced not only the technical nature, but it might also link you know, to your strength and conditioning. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, sort of this, and so by getting the buy-in from your strength and conditioning coach would actually be really advantageous, so that they are on the same page and trying to develop the necessary attributes for, you know, for the team members. And you know, that that for me, that one, because the volleyball is quite a structured, quite a structured sport. It doesn't have the same free flow as, as certainly hockey mm. does. And so I thought that really clear example with Australian beach uh, volleyball, which is um, quite different, will give a, a really clear, be able to, I think for volleyball to be able to see a really clear example of, you know, if we're going to hit on two, then our ability to pass high and to the net is going to be crucial. And so that's going to influence the skill and the, and the techniques that are going to be involved in that, but also for the person who's executing at the net. Um, on two, yeah. then they're going to have to have some attributes um, and be able to track the ball, uh, be able to get their feet in a better position to hit the ball, and and if not, hit it then set it. So, um, well, I, I think that if yeah. you go down a principle based way, it does inform everything. You've hit yeah. the nail on the head there. It's a really good point about S and C because, you know, you can and and that's why I said you know that your principles. It, certainly in my sport have to be flexible enough to deal with the personnel you have because mm. you know you you can't play a certain style unless you have speed you can't play this unless you have that you know um uh, but certainly if you start with the principle the mission it informs everything else the skills that your players need the conditioning that they need everything comes from that idea of how we want to play mm. you know and I, I, I feel I felt that in the past, and I'm talking a distant past now because we changed this in Irish hockey a number of years ago. But when I first sort of got involved, everything was about they need to be able to do it before they can apply it. Mm. Okay. And I actually disagree fundamentally because I think you're wasting a lot of time on skill development and decision making development if you just try and perfect how to do it before putting any context to it. Can you, yeah. that's a really good point, Mick. Can you flesh that out a little bit in case anybody hasn't landed on what you mean by that exactly? So I, I think the way you phrased it was, we spend too much time doing it before we apply it. Like what do you, yeah, can you flesh that out a little bit? So, so basically, if I want to, to learn how to hit a hockey ball, it's quite a difficult thing to do. OK. Um, and and what when when I was younger, many years ago, we would have stood in pairs and we would have hit the ball to each other until we could do it. OK. And then we'd try and apply it to a game situation. But quite often that was done badly as well. You'd play a game where you could only hit. Well, 
you know there's no decision to be made there okay so th there's a lot of there's a lot of skill in game design designing games where you will encourage the skill that you're trying to develop but not enforce it okay but but we would we'd almost try and perfect the technique before we put it into any scenario where it could be used and my argument would be that it should immediately be put into a scenario where it can be used you might find that the player discovers it themselves okay rather than you force feeding it to them they might just instantly do that then if they don't it gives you a really powerful opportunity as a coach to say to them do you know what how could we improve this and if they come back with the answer you want when you do isolate the technique they're doing it contextually because they can see how it applies and it will improve the game and it will help them get better as a player and it help them win you know which is what they want to do so so uh, drills in isolation with no understanding of the context that 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 skill is going to be used are demotivating they're difficult for players to understand they're boring and and when i say drilling i'm talking in in my sport about very short periods of time right so so we work on this but i work on this basis certainly of in a 10 minute period seven minutes of it will be game based and high intensity it might be two minutes isolating a, a, a technique and one minute of recovery drink and a very very brief intervention from the coach if necessary perfect man yeah yeah awesome mike thoughts you know one of the things um you know to i'm going to put out a, a bit of a devil's advocate but then answer it really because one of the things that um, I think comes in coaches' minds at this point is that it gets a bit sloppy, and we're not actually ever doing the technique right. And you know, the you know, and to give an example in, in volleyball context is that you know that we're playing some some sort of game as you're describing uh, with some of those techniques and principles and principles in mind, and it gets really messy, and mm -hmm. um, and then we stop that and we say if we just do it, we take all the pressure out of it, then it looks a lot nicer and we do the skills more correctly. Um, and I think, of course you do, but that doesn't really mean that when you go and play the game on set day, it's going to be any good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've heard it lots and lots of times, you know, Tuesday and Thursday should look a lot like set day. And so the, I think the answer, one of the answers to that, um, answers to that is, that's where you as a coach come in as the magic is being able to say, for example, if the hands need to be up early on the set, nice and early, and that's the thing that's going wrong and the coach's uh, intuition and good eye sees that that's the case. And the player knows that that's the code and that skill that's really important and knows what you mean when you say hands up early. Then um, being on the sideline and, and being able to see that where that issue is and then being able to either question or either prompt the prompt the athlete so that they can execute that skill with their hands up early in the in the instant i'm talking about but any particular of the skills and still yeah. play it in a game context so having you know brought the problem to here hopefully there's an answer in there is that you know we as coaches on the sideline provide that um that feedback system um mm -hmm. help provide it and hopefully we can do it in multiple ways um, and the more the athlete is aware, then they'll be able to provide their own feedback. But if they're not, then um, we can do that as, and help them identify mm -hmm. when they're not doing it well and then make that correction. Now, and I, then I they get to do it in a well, game context. And as I think you've uh, identified in that model, then that game you know, links to the tactics and it also links um, to the principle or the goal um, mm -hmm. of what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think that's a really good point because that's feedback I've been given quite a lot. But I would argue with the coach that that if you stop a session and 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 because you're not feeling comfortable with the way it's going and you and you simplify it to make yourself feel better, then you're servicing yourself. You're not servicing the players. They have to go through that 
level of difficulty and uncomfortableness and failure in order to succeed. Mm. And it's, it's as a younger coach, it was quite difficult to sometimes get in the car after the session and think, well, that was bad. Right? But as a more experienced coach, you understand that that was bad is part of the process to becoming that became good, mm. you know, mm. and, uh, and it's 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 a big mistake I see younger coaches making or less experienced coaches making in that they'll 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 see something that's not working and they want to fix it. They want to fix it instantly or they or they wanna reduce the the difficulty level to make themselves feel comfortable because they want to leave the session feeling that was good. Sometimes mm-hmm. leaving the session thinking what happened on the pitch was bad as long as you is 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 a powerful is a decent enough thing the question you should be asking yourself is did i coach that well not what happened on the pitch what you can control is what did i do did i coach that well um and i know exactly what you mean but going through that those teething problems is part of anything Mm. you know Mm. um it my, my kid learns to walk and if they fall over a couple of times i don't say here go back to crawling you know, you you let them fall over. So, yeah. um, so I think you hit the nail on the head there. That's certainly one of the biggest arguments against this methodology yeah. of coaching. Now, I think the um, you know, to give the scenario we're on the same page here, Mick, is, is that you take the scenario. You you know, there's nothing more that lot than that I like from time to time, especially earlier in the week before the weekend. You know, away from the weekend, where if your athlete is walking onto sand, and they've walked off with a question in their head about how they can improve something, then the reality is then over that next 24 hours, they're thinking about the whole time, because uh, that's how athletes work. That's how we work as coaches too. But that's how they work. Whereas if they go off the sand and they've already solved it, then, you know, they're thinking about, you know, where am I going for coffee and, you know, what am I doing, you know, for the movie tonight? Um, yeah. And that's good too. We should be doing that. But, you know, if we want to get better, then if we're 24 hours, the next 24 hours, we're thinking about, you know, how I can get my feet to position, then that's going to lead to some improvement. And we can only do that if we walk off the sand a little bit uncomfortable and not having solved all the problems. And yeah. certainly um, not have the coach solve the problem or give the answer. So the athlete. Yeah. Mick, I'm just one of the questions, uh, or does it, has it helped your planning of a session doing this, using this model? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. and, uh, um, Can you just tell us how that? Well, I, I would have planned quite meticulously. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, and I would have spent a lot of the time in the session worrying about what was going on it didn't allow me to observe because i'd be looking at my watch going how long for this and how long for that um and now it just i know where i want to get by the end of the session okay and i know where i'm starting and i don't know if you guys know there's a british comedian called billy Connolly. <laughs> you know yes, him, yeah. okay so he i've seen i've seen him live a few times and i've seen him tell the same joke in a completely different manner okay and that's the way i sort of view this allows the training session to veer off in certain places but your eyes always on the goal this is what i want to achieve during this session okay and when I first started as a coach, I wanted it to be linear. We're going to do this for five minutes and we're going to do that and we're going to do that and we're going to do that. Now, this does take experience as a coach. But if your eye in the session is what do I want to achieve? OK, and you take away the rigidity of the planning. OK, mm-hmm. now, obviously, you've a framework within which you want to work. I find it a lot more powerful. You know, yeah. I, I want to get to the punchline, basically. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You know, mm. just picking up on that point, Mick, around observation, because I think that's a really, uh, that's a really key skill. And you mentioned it before, Mike, as well. You know, being able to see what you need to see. So if if we go back to your pyramid and, and we're building it that way, rather than from the bottom up, um, how in an, in any activity or in any given session, are you looking at 
every layer of the pyramid or are you focusing on, you know, today I'm really focusing on this, on the skill, which is linked to the principle, but you know, today is all about the skill. And then next week might be, we're going to look more at a tactical level linked to the same principle or, or are you looking at every layer in every session that's linked to that principle? Does that question make sense? Yeah. In, in general, every session, all four layers. Mm. Okay. Every part of every set. Well, not that's wrong. Every seven minutes, seventy percent part of the session at all four layers. The two minute part yes. might be in the skill layer, it might be in the technique layer down there. Okay. Um, but like to give you an example, in the course of one week, I might coach senior international players, okay, and I might coach um beginners. Right? Okay. And for beginners, the principles can be as simple as when we've got the ball, make it the pitch as big as possible. And when they've got the ball, make the pitch as small as possible. That might be it for a year, you know? Okay. So, so, but everything we do in training will then be dictated by those principles. Okay. If I need them to make the pitch big, I need them to be able to pass big distances. You know, therefore, that will dictate the types of skills that we work on in that in that developmental phase. So, so it's sort of everything's informed by the principles at the top. But to go back to your original question, the the, the seven minute part of it, all four layers are being worked on at, with different emphasis because I wouldn't do much technical work in a high intensity seven seven minute game. But what Mike said is if you've just got a little very brief way of getting your message across, like Mike said, hands up, that can be done in a seven minute intense thing. But what you don't want to be doing is, is doing what I'm doing now and speaking too much. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, but, but to go back to, to something else I'm passionate about, Dave, and I've spoken to you about my view is that as coaches, we need to make our messages as simple as possible right? as administrators we need to make our players lives as simple as possible because we want to make our training as difficult as possible right? so we want the thing that stresses them to be the training right? so as an as a as an organization volleyball new zealand needs to make their their players lives off the field as easy as possible and i'm not talking like easy street but you know try, try and try and help those players as much as they can off the field when we're coaching we need to make our messages simple so that they're not having to figure them out because we want the training to be hard because like mike, mike said earlier on we want to do on us on a weekend what we do on a tuesday and thursday we act, i actually think i want the games to be easier than training sure you know? Yeah. Mm. So, touching on that, Mick, in terms of that simplicity of language, because because Mike, you've had on a few times. You've mentioned the word code, and and I guess um I want to make sure I'm understanding you properly. When you say code, you're meaning like a shared language that everyone in the team understands. Is that right? Yeah, and, and that shared language when we're talking about a large, complex concept is best delivered in a short phrase. Mm -hmm. And a short phrase that has some meaning and some emotion to it, and and ideally uh, has an image to it. You know, so you know the the classic volleyball one, which um, you know is a Kesselism, you know, and is great for young kids, is you know fly like Superman when you're sitting, you know, and so it creates this image. You know, the five year old can get fly like Superman really easy. They have an image in their head. And we as humans, um, you know, I've said this before, and uh, before is language is a really recent phenomenon. Um, as humans, um, we could move for a few, depending on your view of the world, for a few thousand, maybe a million years before we could really talk in languages. So it's going to be the language is just an adjunct at the end. It's not very effective at at learning how to move. So. Um, you know, movement's what we do as, as, as organisms, as humans. So we're really good at picking up movements, and that's done visually. It's from, from doing them visually. So creating a code 
those short phrases, and we know we remember, you know, uh, five plus or minus two really easily. So, you know, a short three, four letter, four word phrase um, is the perfect way that creates an image to be able to, that's what I mean by code. So if I'm spelling that out in a little bit more detail, yep. um, that's what I mean by code. And that's what you're meaning when you talk about making things as simple as possible for athletes, Mick, same kind of Yeah, I, I, I might even go any, even further because um, the challenge I've set myself and the challenge I'm setting coaches is, can we use language that the, the player's parents who know nothing about the sport would understand? Okay, so I hear a lot uh, about team languages and team vocabulary. Okay, and one thing that was a big uh, motivation for me to do this is when you, the the least likely players to speak up in a team meeting and say they don't understand are the newest ones, the ones who've just come in. Okay, so you stand at the front as a coach and you come out with all these phrases, okay, that the experienced players understand, but the younger ones sit at the back and just nod, okay? And, and we do it, I think, as coaches to make ourselves look clever, okay? So we come up with all these phrases. I'll give you an example of one in, in hockey, a, a big buzz phrase was the hotline. You've got to be on the hotline. Right, okay, which means if you're a free defender, you need to be between the ball and the goal. Okay, but my my thing is, if I have to explain that, right, okay, it's not a good enough use of language. Mm. Okay, and that can we, and it's not always possible. But can we challenge ourselves as coaches to use language that is understandable by someone who does not understand our sport? So if we use that example, would you be saying, instead of saying be on the hotline, you'd just be say be on the line between the ball and the goal. You'd be as clear and as simple well, as that. Yeah, we we we've na we we narrowed it down to four words. This is actually on an Irish hockey webinar, so I'm not spilling our secrets here, right? Okay. When our opponents have got the ball, can you pressure them? Can you delay them? Or can you structure? That's it. That, as simple as that. So if a parent came in the room and I said, that player's got the ball, can, can that player put pressure on them? Now, th those things are then defined. So delay would be the one that we'd use in that hotline structure. Can you delay them? And we delay a, our opponents by forcing them to take a longer route towards our goal. You know, um, and what Mike said, hands up is so simple. Superman is so simple. Okay. Any, any I, I don't I know nothing about volleyball and I understood it instantly. And that's the key is I hear lots of fancy phrases. Okay. And in fact, I'm impressed by simplicity and clarity. I'm not impressed by, by all this flowery language. Make sense? <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. And I think when you're, when we're trying to play, you know, a complex, you know, to use your phrase, that seven, I like that seven minutes, you know, of a game situation. Um, and, you know, we just love those game-like activities. Uh, it doesn't need to be a full game, but it needs to look like a, the phrase that we're looking at is like a game. Then we have those short phrases. Then when we say them, or we even don't even sometimes say them, we just use our body to imitate them then we don't even use words. So if I'm on the sideline, I might just go like this, then the setter is already thinking, oh, Mike means hands up early and has their own interpretation of that. And we can communicate a lot of information either in short phrases or just in actions. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, in, you know, if I'm, if I'm hitting, I'm just want to open the door and quite, I find myself a lot of times um, with one of my players is doing, doing this bit here quite often. Uh, mm -hmm. So they can just, so I'm not giving a whole phrase or a conversation. I'm just doing this action and then we're on the same page and we, we and uh, hopefully they're tapping into that, um, that I liked it or, you know, or if I'm reinforcing it or whether they can open up a little bit more. Yeah. 
No, I, th- I, th- I think it's a real challenge for coaches. It's, it's a nice little thing it, in your sport because there's four players or two players. You know, it's it's a um, th- it's a a bit more simple. But say we're work. I'm working with a squad of twenty five. Mm-hmm. I have real concerns about the one, the ones who come in, being able to understand the language immediately you know as opposed to you know Mm. and 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 my challenge is can their parents understand it because if their parents can understand they know and dave you might be something you try in rugby okay where you bring a group of players in for for a team talk or a debrief and then bring a couple of their parents in sit them at the back and say did you understand what i was saying Mm. because if you didn't then if they didn't, then you might need to challenge yourself. Can I change the way I put things across? Mm. I mean, I had a perfect example. This was a, a lesson very early on in my coaching career was where I was doing a session for an under 14 rugby team all around the ruck. So, you know, cleaning out the ruck and, and, and uh, at the breakdown. And I just spent 15 minutes running them through this bloody amazing activity around uh, the ruck. And then the guy who was coaching with me, I was like, all right, over to you, Kenny. And the first question he asked was, who knows what a ruck is? And mm-hmm. two kids put their hand up. <laughs> so I, I was walking back being like, man, nailed that session. Everybody, you know, man, they understand rucks. And just one simple question, who knows what a ruck is? And, and yeah, two of the 16 were like, yeah, I know what it is. <laughs> so yeah, I, I learned that lesson the hard way. Yeah. So that, that and, and I think that's that's what my passion in coaching is about, really simplifying things and to bring it back to that pyramid. I think having the, the principle, the goal, the mission at the top is a simplification of things. This is what we need you to achieve. Because the game we play is chaotic, okay, I, I can give them a framework as to how we achieve it, but I can't tell them specifically it as to how it's going to do and the same in volleyball because you 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 don't control your opponents so you know there's another team and there's another coach who are doing things like you say with the australian team playing on two okay you you can have the biggest game plan in the world to play against them and they walk out and their coach has told them look they're expecting us to play on two so we're playing three today you know it's uh you know there has to be your by by going to a mission you 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 empower your players to find solutions to things within a framework that you've created so if i can i think close the circle on this this point on language and link it back to that pyramid Mick, my last question to you is so how if we use that um the principle you shared right at the start so we want to win the ball high up the high up the pitch and on the inside mm-hmm. would your if you know if someone was on the call who was a player that had been coached by you, would they use that language or would they know that language? Like, are you are they on the same page in terms of we know what this principle is, or or is it different for them? No, that that they that would be the that they'd understand what the goal was, you know, um, and that's you know, and and that's why I have sleepless nights about whether the word should be mission goal or principle because the language is so important it has to be as clear as possible we want our players to receive clear messages because the thing they're doing is difficult the thing we're doing is relatively easy they're they're the ones who have to do it okay so we don't want them having confusion or gray areas in their mind you know this is what i need you to achieve an analogy i use i'm not sure if it's that appropriate but when the u.s navy seals went to capture bin laden okay they had a a mission to capture bin laden and the plan was to land a black hawk on the ground and a black hawk on the roof of his complex and to sweep the building from from both sides to trap him in the middle but one the black hawks crashed now had they been told this is the the plan they they would have aborted it but they had a mission so they had to think on their feet there was a framework 
for what they did and then they changed the plan on the fly because they knew what they were trying to achieve and that's that's where there's flexibility in a principle there's less control for the coach but there's flexibility within it that's why the language is really important the, the, there has to be clarity for players mm. nice that's good um, Mike I'm going to flick back to you and I don't know if there's an answer to this question or not but going back to that example trying to draw it back to volleyball um, that example you gave around the, the Australian beach team and their tactic around hitting off two is there this is where I say I don't know if there's an answer or not. Is there if you if you dig a little bit deeper on that, like what would be the what would be the purpose of them wanting to use that tactic? I guess what I'm trying to get at is is there a principle or a mission, as Mick would say, that sits above that that's made them go, okay, we're going to try and attack off two? Or you'd have to ask KP that one, so, <laughs> um, and and further back from not just KP the the, the philosophy that they started a few years ago because they've been doing it for a long time. So. Um, um, and I wouldn't like to kind of guesstimate on that. Um, in this that forum, but I think the yeah it certainly has some quali it has some consequences for the defence um, in terms of the stress it puts them under. So I suppose if we're thinking about you know volleyball, um, not just that example of two, but if we think of uh, if we wanted to say for example in our team we wanted to attack a lot through the through the back line. That was going to be one of the things that we did well. Um, we could either through the pipe or through the D um, that we're going to attack a lot through the back line. Then that then would mean that we'd have to do a lot of warm up doing those three meter attacks. Um, we'd want to develop that drifting skill. Um, we'd certainly want to develop our strength and conditioning and our rehab around that. So there's a you know, landing that is a little bit different when you're drifting so far. Um, so I think it aligns the, the model itself. Um, would then guide um, the things that you do, for example, if you wanted to um, attack a lot through the D. So in my head, the um, and I'm thinking indoor volleyball here, there's some variations, but um, you know, we, we try to hit quick and we try to go to the pins low um, and we try to have variety in our offense. And everybody's doing the same sort of thing really they're going the pins low they're hitting you know three meters um, and various they're trying to have five on the offense so offensively um, it's pretty standardized in a way and I think if we were going to be an indoor team we wanted to have in either for a specific team on the weekend or if we wanted to have for a specific goal for our season then we could still using this model say, okay, so what does this mean? And sitting down for, you know, with the athletes, I think that's where I saw the value in this model of going, okay, so we could terse out um, working through the model about how we could influence what we did at training and perhaps even how much time we spent on certain aspects. Um, you know, I would say, you know, if we're gonna hit um, from moving from inside to outside at the pins, then that's going to influence a lot of what we're trying to do in our training environment. Um, yeah, so I certainly think that there's really va real value in coaches using this model to map out both season and also map out sessions. Um, as Mix, you know, alluded to when, you know, the way that they're using it. And that, you know, the thing that's come through really strongly from me which I didn't pick up as strongly when I read the through the first time is how it relates to let's call it goal mission, um, and how that could be really influential on this um, on a day to day sense. I'm not sure I answered Hockey's, the question at all, but there's a hockey's not dissimilar, Dave. Most teams play reasonably similar styles, mm -hmm. and this isn't about devising new methodologies or new tactics it's really about delivery of message and to touch upon what mike says it's actually quite handy for um self-reflection as a coach because mm -hmm. you might leave a session and if you've done nothing that applies to the principles of your game then what was the point of it 
<laughs> like you know um the you hear a coach saying oh i saw a great exercise or saw i saw a great game i saw this or i saw this on the internet and you're like yes but does it apply to your team mm. okay so it's actually a nice way of reviewing your session mm. if you've done a session and it doesn't apply to your principles well it mm. might have been a bit of fun but mm. probably a waste of time it can act as a filter at times to go does does this align with what i'm trying to achieve yeah, yeah. for me we keep using the word model for me it's just a way of thinking mm. that's mm. just a way of it's just a it's just a thought process it allows it gives me clarity in my thought and i i, I would use this analogy quite a lot that i actually think coaches when they come into the sport if they've played a lot okay they they have too much information not too little mm. okay so so our w with people who who are like that our job as coach educators is to help them filter the information into easy easily accessible ways of finding it so the analogy i'd use is i've have a friend a, a, a shared friend with dave over here and his desktop is a disgrace right on his laptop right okay so there's there's notes all over it you can't find anything and every time he presses the button he gets the spinny wheel because his computer can't find it either right okay and my i i believe our job is to put things into to use that analogy to put things into folders and just to be able to access them whenever we need them as quick as quickly as we need them so so this is about trying to give people clarity of thought because i think that younger coaches especially those that have played a lot they've got too much information i actually said to dave i worry about this lockdown where these coaches go on two webinars a day right, okay and they're getting so much information actually do you know what <laughs> okay that that could be dangerous to you, your development as a coach not actually enhance it you know and and this is years of me being able to condense the way i think into one model basically mm -hmm. yeah. i think i think that's There's what i was still in that yeah, totally, and, and that's what's that's what's still in there. That's really what struck for me when you when you know when you showed it to me back in Ireland and, and why I thought um, it has relevance here. And, and I don't know a lot about volleyball either, um, as you both know. But in being involved with volleyball New Zealand and seeing a lot more of the sport, it's if anything, it's triggered my thoughts to be like, well, what what could some of the principles of volleyball be? You know, and even that that concept that you mentioned in hockey, make the pitch as wide as possible. It's got me thinking, well. In volleyball, do you want to make the court as wide as possible? So if you drag your hitters out to be hitting as close to the pins as possible, does that mean that the and Mike, I'm happy for you to say that's terrible volleyball chat day, shut up. But that's exactly that's exactly what we should be trying to do all the time is go to the yeah, you go. You well I was gonna say and then, then you hope you would hope that it's gonna stress the defense more because they've got further to travel. Yeah. So, you know, is that a principle that a coach can take away and be like, actually, yeah, maybe maybe we should be thinking about how do we make the court as wide as possible or um, you know, talking with Johan a little bit in the office, I know he's he's very big on getting the pass really high to give our our setters and our hitters a time to adjust. And so that's got me thinking. Well, what's the you know what's the principle or what's the mission that kind of sits around that particular skill um, or tactic? Probably is probably the right way to put it. So I guess that's my my yeah. challenge or my my question to people watching this is is let it stimulate your thought and let it you know let it kind of challenge you to be like, well, what what are some of the bigger picture ideas that can help me and my team get real clarity of what we're trying to achieve? So I think you've summed that up really nicely, Matt, because that's the way I, I view it as well. It's, 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 a, it's a tool to help you really clarify and get some um, consistency in, in, in how you think about the sport. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, let's leave it oh. there then. And is, is it, Mike, is there anything you want to say to finish off? Really like the simplicity, mate. Good. Really good. like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice to meet you too, mate. And you. It's, it's a compliment to be called simple yeah. sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yes, that, but it's a compliment to be called simple sometimes, you know. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Look, thanks, thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah. I never thought I'd be asked to chat about volleyball. So, uh, yeah, give me a, give me a new interest. So. And I will. Um, 
I will put when I post the video. I'll post it in a couple of weeks, I think. Um, yeah. But for those people watching, I will I will include a link to Mick's website um, in the in the info as well because he's he's got some really good uh, blogs and, and articles that he's written on coaching that again have relevance for every coach in every sport. So um, if you've liked some of his thinking, then I, I, you'll like you'll like his blogs and, and that sort of thing too. So I'll make sure uh, make sure you check that out. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, awesome. Mike. Yeah. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Right, yeah. Thanks.